several speakers mentioned cost optimizations, but in general, we skirted the issue of costs and carbon pricing. So what market or policy levers do, do people think will it take to make uh, carbon to value and, and, uh, and net carbon uh, systems a reality? Uh, Damien, for instance, mentioned our LCFS standard as being critical to uh, Schlumberger's plant viability. That's one of the highest carbon values in the world. So I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in, in any of the speakers or panelists thoughts on uh, policy levers and, and, uh, and market levers. Um, we've talked about LCFS, which is quite a local thing in, in, a, in a world sense. Uh, I think we, only, we are only going to be able to move forward if we have some sort of uh, worldwide incentives or, or worldwide taxes. Uh, we can imagine, for example, in, let's take Europe, for example, uh, if we do have a, if we do set up a, a significant uh, carbon tax, we'd also have to have this carbon tax within, but also, uh, so within Europe, but also for, for materials that don't have any sort of carbon tax coming into Europe. Uh, so to avoid uh, any sort of, any companies um, having to shut down because they don't have their, you know, don't, don't have their revenue and, and being, being undercut by, uh, by other places. So I think there has to be a worldwide thought about this and uh, getting as many people on board. Uh, but the tax is gonna, or taxes or incentives are gonna have to go both ways. Uh, and try to make sure that everyone's on a level playing field. And to complement that, and I'll try to talk about this, but uh, I, I was over my 10 minutes talking about market mechanism. I think that right now th there is no real market mechanism to value carbon by, by the market itself, not by policies and incentives and government's prices, but by the market. And if you look at consumers of commodities of steel and cement and ammonia etc they are some of them and it will grow quite fast if they all have uh, net zero targets uh, themselves uh, they will be interested in buying decarbonized products but right now there is no real option for them to buy those products other than just sporadically or uh, using some some carbon credit markets or offsets and so I think that the emergence in the next few years of trustable, auditable, uh, global uh, systems whereby one can access commodities that are decarbonized and pay a premium for that uh, will be um, growing in the coming years and becoming more and more prevalent. And this is something that we are already testing, for example, in the cement industry. How can you have a global um, carbon intensity target for cement and actually being able to sell lower carbon intense product in the market and asking the consumers of those products to pay a premium for that. It seems a little bit idealistic right now. And some people will raise eyebrows and saying nobody will pay a premium. But I think that you know, it's not only about the government. It's not only about consumers. You need to have parallel pathways to develop this. And a market mechanism will complement policies in providing the confidence for people to invest 100 million in decarbonizing their plant. Uh, and you know, much of it will be done across a variety of sectors and um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think we can see the, the value of some of these local policies, right? If you look at the LCFS in driving the uh, the renewable natural gas um, boom. Uh, you look at Europe for HVO uh, with 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 the large uh, all the volumes locked up there. The issue is that these are small markets, right? So so getting additional volumes into play, whether that's through additional states taking on the LCFS model, or, or Europe more broadly applying some of its uh, its taxations would would be would be very useful. Um, and again, that plays into that more global market uh, market size. I would add to, 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 the, to the customer though, you know, customers are asking more and more for some of the decarbon, um, uh, low carbon or, or offsetting type uh, offers. Uh, and we see this in Europe, right? So there, there is go, go um, zero fuel in, in the UK market, Netherlands and, and other markets now where there is a small uplift in premium, a little bit like, uh, you know, advanced fuels where you have um, you know, V power like for Shell, um, where customers are prepared to pay a, a small uplift to, uh, to offset uh, you know, where, where e, e, e vehicles aren't possible. And I yeah. think also that maybe customers or consumers of one sort or another actually don't know the final cost. And I think we should start to discuss the final cost of products which are decarbonized. And we may find out, or we, we already know that uh, 
it's not always a huge premium. And I think uh, if we start to sort of communicate on that, um, that may help the way forward and also may help policy because then uh, our, our deciders in general, the politicians may then sort of uh, think, okay, it's not that, that expensive, we can move forward on this. Yeah. Jim and yeah. Sabina, any comments from, from you? Yes, and I'll move, I, on to, I'll move on to the next question after you. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I think that uh, looking back at what I was saying about the big innovation gap and, and the kind of acceleration that we need, there is definitely a case to support, even with like technology specific uh, support, um, uh, certain developments. Um, but I think what, uh, what was said about uh, market mechanisms can definitely also be a strong incentive, especially if you also communicate a certain minimum uh, carbon uh, prices, then the question arises, of course, how, how high should the carbon price be? And, and should removals be worth the same as uh, avoided CO2? And in principle, if we could um, measure the sort of, of climate effect uh, of, of a removed ton and, and sort of break that down, then the price should be, be the same. But there could, of course, be all sorts of, of distortions and, and external effects that you, that you might want to take into account. And I, I think um, that, is, that is something to, to, to move towards, too. So the, in Europe, for instance, um, the Commission is, is working on a um, carbon removal certification mechanism. Uh, and that is, of course, with a view towards the possibility to also include um, the remuneration of carbon removal in, in, in market-based uh, systems. I'm, I'm not saying that it will be included anytime soon in the, in the emissions trading trading system. Uh, I, I don't think we're, we're there yet, um, but uh, that would definitely be, be, be a, a sign um, uh, for investors as a strong signal to, to sort of act upon. Um, in, in the end, uh, a ton uh, of, of, of CO2 that we decide we still have to have around would sort of need to pay for its, for its own removal in, in such a system. The problem then is if we go net negative, uh, who, who, where does the revenue come from uh, to pay for that? Uh, then we're sort of asking companies to that, that remove, uh, that go net negative to provide a, a sort of public good. And um, yeah, I think I'll leave it with that. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Okay. okay. And, and of course there are, um, you know, there are other drivers of that carbon negative uh, um, aspect and, and there are companies uh, in the, the Amazon, the tech companies, um, other companies in different parts of the world that are pushing for, for carbon removal and carbon negative technologies to be developed. That, that's not a big enough push to, to answer this, but it will help drive the technology. Um, we, I, we have one question from a tool that was asked relatively early on this morning. Uh, the question is, what do you see as the most critical milestones by 2030 for the U.S. to get to net zero by 2050? And I don't think we have to restrict this question just to the U.S. So what are the critical milestones by 2030 to get to net zero by 2050 that different panelists and speakers see? I guess by 2030, a milestone would be um, progress in several of these trends that we talked about, whether it's a... Um, um, geologic sequestration, whether it's a converting to some valuable fuels or nature-based solutions. I think there has to be significant sort of change or increase in these activities by 2030. So unless that happens, I think um, it would be challenging um, anything meaningful. Um, we can achieve that goal by 2050. So here we are in 2021, I think we have nine years and obviously we need to see a lot more progress in, um, in, in, uh, by 2030. So we are talking about a step change in all of these uh, technologies use. I, th I think in terms of storage, if we do know the step, step change that we want to go to 20 to 2050 or, 20, or beyond, then by 2030, we're gonna have to have demonstration products uh, projects around the world on different types of aquifers on land and offshore uh, just so that we can as a, as a, as a whole um, sh show to our stakeholders that uh, that storage is possible uh, I think that's uh, that's I think we have to have all of these in place so so the northern lights project uh, uh, other, the other projects in the north sea in in, uh, in um, 
in depleted uh, depleted reservoirs. We would it'd be nice to have a project of the, the same the same scale uh, in the Middle East, um, uh, of course uh, in Australia. So uh, no, and and of course in the US, but around the world, we're going to need. Uh, large, medium ton, several medium ton demonstration products uh, projects uh, in, in place by 2030, I think. Yeah, given the scale of timelines, right, if we haven't got, not just in CCS, but in uh, across the board, whether that's, uh, you know, it's a second generation uh, biomass deconstruction pilots, or, or be that uh, hydrogen or, or any of the technologies that we want to get in play, uh, including storage, we need to have pilots across the board and globally. Um, to give that 10 or 15 year ramp up time and, and potentially even 20 year ramp up time. If we don't have that steel in the ground by 2030, then we're on the back foot. We certainly need to have um, up and running plants in each critical sector in the cement, in steel. Um, there are some that are a bit more like low hanging fruit, like ammonia or hydrogen or biofuels. Uh, certainly, we need to have a, a very good idea on cost and where we can get in ends of a kind. Um, we need to have already uh, the line of sight for the creation of large scale hubs in critical places where you have large industrial concentration. Yeah, I think Europe is taking a little bit of a lead there around the North Sea Rim. Uh, much more needs to happen in the US to have a concerted approach around developing those hubs as opposed to having you know, in my backyard kind of approach from my point source to dedicated storage. So more work needs to be done in collaboration uh, to develop those, those networks. And that will give really the foundation for a very large scale deployment. Um, those one of projects are important to demonstrate cost and to understand how it works, but really those networks are really what will be the backbone to create a deployment at large scale. Yeah, I think I think hubs is a, is a is a very critical point that sometimes we forget. Um, quite simply, because uh, the use of hubs will overcome problems of intermittency, intermittency in terms of energy, but also intermittency in terms of emissions. For example, if we have a, uh, a future scenario where we're going to be using natural gas uh, combustion to 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 overcome. Uh, some of the energy dips in, in, in uh, renewable energy. So these the natural gas stations are up and running, stopping, up and running, stopping. And, and uh, we can't have the capture technologies that, uh, the, the, in, in, it actually takes time to get these capture technologies to, to ramp up. So the use of hubs will overcome these sort of things. Um, and of course, we'll also have economy of scale as we go to, uh, go to this, some of these hubs.